Hello, one and all. Bienvenue à tous. If you're tuning in live, thanks for making time for us today in your busy day. If you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. Whichever way you're watching, welcome to Post Media's third season of Driving Into the Future. I'm David Booth, and I'm the senior writer for Driving.ca. Today, Driving Into the Future will look at traffic congestion, as in, traffic's a mess, how do we fix it? Now, I doubt there are any Canadians who have not known the joy that is a traffic jam. Certainly everyone that drives in one of our three major cities feels the pain. In fact, getting stuck in traffic is such a common everyday occurrence that many of us treat it as an inevitable fact of life. But does it have to be? Are there technologies that smooth the flow of traffic on our highways? Can smarter computers help speed up our daily commute? Is congestion pricing, charging motors for the right to drive into urban centers, inevitable? And what is multimodal mobility and how does it help us reduce, reduce traffic? To help us answer all these questions, as well as provide some practical tricks for uh, sliding through traffic, we're joined today by a diverse panel of experts who truly understand what causes gridlock. Christine Darbels, the Senior Director of Public Affairs for the Canadian Automobile Association. Bahir Abdelhai, Professor at the University of Toronto and Director of the Toronto Intelligent Transport Systems Centre. Sabrina Martineau, Vice President and Practice Lead, Civil Engineering Services Canada for SNC-Lavalin. And finally, Omar Chaudhry, Project Lead for Ottawa's Transportation System Management. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us today. Before we start proceedings, let me also welcome all our viewers and inform them that we will be trying to answer some of your questions later in this discussion. So, uh, what a truly exciting time to be in the automotive industry. And we're in the midst of a game-changing carbon reduction revolution, but at the same time, we're facing a huge challenge in traffic congestion in all of our major cities even some of our smaller ones. Canada in a good year sells 2 million cars a year. And even if the pandemic has slowed that down a bit, cars would seem as popular as ever. Christine, I'm going to let you set the tone. How bad are our roads? How no surprise that Canada's top 10 worst tra traffic jams are in the GTA, Montreal and Vancouver. What are the top bottlenecks in our country? How long do they delay, delay Canadians in our commute to work? And because we Canadians have an inferiority about a complex about everything, even traffic, how do we compare with other countries like, say, the United States? Well, first of all, thanks, David, uh, for having me uh, here today. Uh, let's start with um, sort of the top bottlenecks in, in Canada and where they are. You mentioned GTA, Montreal, Vancouver. Well, specifically... Highway 401 in Toronto is not going to be a surprise. Neither will the DVP in Toronto. In Montreal, uh, the big bottlenecks are Highway 40 and Highway 15. Um, Gardner Expressway in Toronto, that won't surprise anyone else. Um, and then in Vancouver, we've got Granville and West Georgia um, in Vancouver that, uh, that, that are really, really plugged up in bottlenecks. And even though our study, so this particular study, which was called CAA's bottleneck study, was done pre-pandemic, um, you know, these highways and these bottlenecks are already starting to get plugged up right again. So they might have been calm during the pandemic, but, you know, we're seeing the same patterns we did uh, uh, pre-pandemic. And, um, you know, you had mentioned how we compare to the to the U.S. So Canada's worst um, bottlenecks um, are almost as bad as top bottlenecks in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City. Um, and specifically, it's the DBP, Gardner Expressway, and Highway 40 and 15 in Montreal. Those are all part of the top 20 worst bottlenecks in all of North America. So we're up there playing in the big leagues with Chicago and New York and, and Los Angeles as well. Now, traffic, can, oh, go ahead. No, no, thanks very much for those rather depressing statistics, Christine. <laughs> um, Sabrina, traffic congestion takes a toll beyond just frustrating mo uh, motors and making us all late for work, doesn't it? Uh, from a business perspective, what do traffic jams cost us and what are its effects? Are there industries, for instance, that are wor hurt worse than others? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, to, uh, to have me uh, with, uh, with you and all the panelists today. I'm really uh, glad to be here. Uh, okay, so like you said, uh, we, we, we have really big problem of traffic and the most, most of the people are really angry when they are on road about those problems. But that's not the only thing that uh, can put people angry when they are on road. But the traffic is one of the biggest uh, impact uh, for them. So um, we can imagine that all of that impact, uh, how it's, it's translated into uh, the business and the economy, uh, we see that this is a big, big, big impact on all the businesses and also, uh, also on the, the cost of the economy when we think about uh, the, the commute time and the delays that it can occur to the people when they are commuting from a point A to a point B. So if we take, for example, uh, in the US, for example, in 2017, uh, that, that was a, a big, big amount of money that was related to uh, the traffic impact. Uh, they, uh, they said that uh, two, $305 billion uh, was an amount of money uh, due to, uh, to, to the, the traffic impact to the economy. So you can imagine how much money that it can represent uh, for, for all of them. If we try to compare here uh, in Canada, we don't really have the same kind of uh, information, but we have um, uh, in 2017, there, there is a study that have been made by uh, Transport Canada at that time that give us a little bit of kind of the same information. And it was uh, representing uh, $6 billion annually uh, for us in Canada. Uh, of lost productivity, uh, increase also the fuel uh, con uh, consumption, and also to increase uh, the gas as uh, the gas as gas emission. So that's almost the same representativity uh, than in the U.S. So that's a huge, huge impact. And if we think about where we are going into the future, the the population will continue to increase. So we're gonna see, for example, in maybe 20 years that we, we can maybe be in Canada, uh, 50 million, something like that. So all that amount of money and impact will continue to grow. And we need to, to think about that, to find a solution to reduce that, that impact for all the businesses and, uh, and, 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 and the economy in general. So you asked me, is there some kind of type of industry that are more impacted than others? Uh, yeah, honestly, if we think about everything related to transportation, uh, shipping, trucking, uh, retail, uh, hospitality sector, everything that needs to be on time uh, are really, really uh, suffering a lot about, about that. Uh, all, all the companies that are more in the urban area are so, of course, are more impacted than the other a little bit outside of the city. So uh, if we think about in Canada, the, the population of Canada is really concentrated more like everywhere else in US, for example, in the, the urban area. So of course, more more company are impacted more businesses so uh so this is where we uh, we enter into that system as engineer uh we are pretty well involved with all the 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 type of client public client cities uh transportation government and we try to help them uh to find some solution to reduce those impact on the traffic and to uh also it's going to give them at, at the end, some great solution to uh, to make sure that they will ameliorate uh, globally the, the the roads and the, the transit and everything. So they need they need us in engineering to do uh, to do help uh, help them and support. So when we think about engineering, uh, we we always say that everything is doable. We just need to make sure that for the client, it's going to have uh, an added value. 
and also it will be uh, commercially uh, viable. So we need to, to express to them how they can find some solution with a proper cost to reduce the impact for the, for the public. So. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Omar, to we, the laymen, uh, and especially we laymen stuck in traffic late for yet another important meeting, the solution seems simple. Just build more highway highways, darn it. But it isn't as simple as that, is it? Why doesn't simply adding more lanes reduce congestion? Well, thanks, David. I really appreciate joining this panel. Uh, yeah, and I wish the, the solution was that simple and, and certainly something that was not uh, contentious. Um, there is, I think in your opening remarks, you sort of indicated that there's, you know, a, a, a wide range of opinions as to more roads, more transit, every no, all cars, no cars and so forth. Um, but I think it's sort of maybe to take a step back, it's important to understand that really there's a symbiotic kind of relationship between land use and transportation. Right um, down in the states, back in you know the late uh, late nineties, early two thousands, there was a lot of uh, stories about bridges to nowhere and pet projects that senators and, and congressmen and congress people would put out. Um, and the reality is that no one's going to really take a road if it goes nowhere and doesn't do anything, right? So there must be something along that road or at the end of that road that will attract people. So it could be an amusement park, it could be a residential community. Uh, job location like a warehouse where people could work or maybe just a bypass that allows you to avoid the traffic and get around go around the city as opposed to going through the city that would get you to your destination a little bit faster um, and there's a lot of reasons why uh, an organization a municipality or a provincial government may decide to build it may uh, a road new roads and and or add new lanes um, it could be safety related uh, too many crashes head-on collisions and so forth so by separating the lanes and putting a, uh, you know, a divider um, so forth, that would actually increase safety. Um, it could be providing new links or added capacity because you're seeing that there are people going from one part of the city to another part of the city and providing a linkage that that's maybe more um, effective. Um, and, and then there could be a more sort of localized type of uh, opportunities, what sometimes you'll see on the highway uh, where an on-ramp becomes an off-ramp and that auxiliary lane basically extends the the distance over which cars exiting and cars entering can actually weave and merge into the into the traffic and that sort of reduces those pinch points um, and tries to sort of flatten those out um, but I think sort of you know uh, this the second part of what you're really trying to get to is you know why don't these good times last we build the road we we expand and and congestion should never come back and the really, you know, the reality is, is that we all sort of find our own, you know, balance of time, money, convenience in, in, in the way we make decisions. Uh, we do it more if you're actually going to take a trip to Europe and you look at the airfare and you say, well, direct to Rome will be this. But if I go through one stop, it'll be four hours later, but I'll save $250. Maybe I'll, that's worth my time and my that extra little bit. Um, and so we make those decisions sort of on those bigger, longer trips, but on our daily sort of activity, we don't tend, tend to really look at it at that level, sort of granular level. And so when, when, when a new road is built and, and or new capacity is added, uh, what we really find is that there's sort of, I guess we'll say four kind of factors that, 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 that come into play. So one is, you know, that people will change the road that they take. Now they hear that the highway is, has an extra lane, Traffic is supposed to be a little bit faster. So rather than taking road A, they'll take road B as long as it doesn't create a long diversion or, or a, you know, a, a, a go around path that they have to take. Um, then you also sort of will see modal shifts. So if you, you know, I think in Toronto recently, there was an announcement of a weekend service from go on go uh, to Hamilton and Niagara. So now there's an opportunity where people, instead of driving, they can actually take transit. And so you'll see that shift depending upon what actually infrastructure is built, people move between car, bus, bike, walking, and so forth, depending upon that sort of a capability. Um, there's, a, there's an aspect of what we would call induced demand, which is really people who wouldn't have taken that trip now might decide to take that trip. Um, and because there's a now a new functionality or a new path that, that they can get. Uh, but I think the other sort of thing is just to recognize is that uh, we're having population growth. Our cities continue to grow. Um, and if you just think of cities growing at 3% a year, 
basically population doubles in 25 years. And so more people need more trips and people then therefore need to take some sort of mode of trans and transportation. And, uh, you know, by de facto over the last 25, 30, 40 years, the car has been the way that people get around. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that simple, slightly depressing explanation, <laughs> um, Professor Abdelhai. Uh, you're working on technology that could reduce congestion without building more roads. Uh, I think it even uses artificial intelligence. Why don't you tell us what exactly causes bottlenecks? How intelligent ramp metering solves the problem, and how much all this high tech might reduce our travel times? Thank you, David, for having me. Well, let's start with the basics. Uh, what causes bottlenecks? Simply put in layman's terms, if you have four lanes on a freeway, for instance, becoming three, then that's a bottleneck. Now, this happens at every on-ramp because at each every and every on-ramp, you add a lane, take the traffic coming from the on-ramp, try to merge, merge it with the main stream, and then take that lane away. So essentially, at each on-ramp on a freeway, you are um, dealing with a bottleneck. Now, that is where congestion starts. Some of the basics of congestion are easy to understand in layman terms. Some are more subtle. So I'll try to explain both to the, to the extent I can. So um, imagine that three-lane freeway has a capacity of 6,000 vehicles per hour and then you throw at it 7,000 vehicles per hour. It will not fit. It's like putting on um, uh, a shoe that is two sizes smaller than your foot. It's, it's not gonna fit. So because you're throwing at it uh, a number of cars that's larger than the capacity of the road, then there will be some uh, traffic backed up and this is the onset of congestion that propagates in the upstream. But it doesn't end there. The problem is when you, when you have the situation of demand exceeding the capacity of the freeway, the capacity of the freeway itself drops. There is turbulence. We all experience this, people fighting near the own ramp for space and so on. Then that turbulence cuts the capacity down. You lose capacity during rush hour. And we call this in traffic flow theory, the capacity drop. So that capacity capacity drop, even if it is like 15, 20%, can double the time we spend on the highways. So what do we do now? Like if it simply is not fitting and uh, it's degrading even further when we are desperate for every bit of capacity, what can we do? Well, uh, it's a simple ratio, capacity, uh, sorry, as a demand over capacity exceeds one. So either you expand capacity, expand the road, which we know that uh, that is constrained by money and space and it takes billions of years and decades uh, to build up. Uh, or you uh, build, for instance, transit, uh, transit alternatives such as commuter rail in particular, such as uh, Go Transit. But you could the other, go the other way and say, okay, why don't we reduce demand? And when you talk about reducing demand, then you're talking about uh, things like congestion pricing, which we'll um, uh, discuss later. Uh, but there is a third way, which is to use smart technology to kind of prevent that capacity drop that I'm talking about. Because what happens is when we rush into the road, we simply clog it. I have a nice video here, if, uh, if you can play it, it's, it's a minute or so video that would explain this phenomenon, um, where like, if you clog the road, no one is rushing anywhere. Can we play that video? I call the Doug McDonald setup, and these two funnels represent two freeways, identical ones. This is not so smart freeway, this is a smarter freeway. And what I have here is rice kernels representing cars. So what happens during rush hour every day? We simply rush. So this is us, and this is how we get on the freeway. As you see, this is the congestion that you go through. This is what gets you frustrated, delayed, and punching each other. So now what? What do we do to make things better? Well, the solution, as I mentioned, slow down, pace yourself. This is the smart highway now. So what I'm gonna do, pour the rice slowly, 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 
Everybody is going through. No one is stuck in congestion. Nobody is screaming. Nobody is kicking. Nobody is punching. So it, they, it, it becomes faster to get home if you actually slow down. Now, I cheated a little bit here. I know how to paste this rice in the funnel so it would not get stuck like the first one. But in real life, on a real road, how would we come up with that pace? This is where artificial intelligence comes in. So as you see, like we, what you just saw before your eyes is that you, you, we call it rush hour for a reason I don't know. No one is rushing anywhere where it's just like maybe blood is rushing through our veins, but we're not going anywhere. And the solution here is to pace the traffic. Pacing is a secret sauce. Pacing meaning pour traffic into the network at a pace that uh, guarantees it will not exceed capacity and trigger the, the gridlock that we deal with. So how do we do that? How do you pace traffic in? Uh, one way to do it is by controlling the inflow getting into the highway from um, on ramps. Uh, we simply put um, simple like green and light traffic light at the, at the end of the ramp and inject cars on the freeway one at a time. And the artificial intelligence software calculates based on current road conditions, how many cars to inject per minute or per, 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 per unit time, such that the traffic on the main freeway, as well as the traffic from the own ramp that is merging in combined, doesn't exceed the capacity of the freeway and therefore uh, does not cause that traffic meltdown. So what would that do? Just reversing that capacity drop can cut down delay on the freeway by half. That is 50% possibly at some locations, 50% reduction um, in, in the freeway. And there are other methods. So ramp control or ramp metering, what I just explained is one, but you can also pace traffic on the freeway itself with dynamic speed limits. So you can tell motorists, for instance, yes, I know the, speed, the static speed limit is 100 kilometers per hour, but now I need you to travel at 60 kilometers per hour because you are uh, uh, approaching slowed down traffic. So slow down a little bit, as you saw in the rise video, so you would not trigger the, the bottleneck. And congestion pricing is also another uh, method of pacing and so on. That's perfect. Thanks very much, Professor. I, I like the demonstration. Um, Christine, um, a few more, a little more discussion on solutions to traffic problems. And, and who better to offer practical solutions than the CEA, who've been helping Canadian motors for almost 120 years now? So what are some of the lower hanging fruit that will help us alleviate our traffic? So um, there's a couple of things, and it, it's funny, it's a, a perfect uh, a follow up. Um, so some of the low um, hanging fruit that we have here is basically traffic management um, um, and better incident management. So one of the uh, examples is something like screens. You think about, you know, a collision that happens on a highway and a collision can sometimes take away an entire lane because that's where the collision is. But then you add in the rubber necking and my gosh, we all want to slow down and see what happened. Um, so there's this thing, um, it's called a, an in incident screen, which actually blocks the view of motorists when they're going by. So they can't see what's going, going on. And it means that they're just going, their traffic flow is just going to continue on. This is actually used in the United Kingdom and um, the United Kingdom Highway Agency actually estimated on average the economic benefit from using incident screens was around $300,000 per incident. So really helping the, the, the traffic uh, flow through. And again, it's just something as simple as telling people to just stop looking. <laughs> Another um, a really low hanging fruit is uh, something called Freeway um, uh, Service Patrols, FSP. Um, and essentially these are just trained personnel with specialized equipment vehicles. And all their job is to do is to go up and down highways and freeways and look for incidents. And as soon as an incident happens, their job is to clear it again so that we don't plug up that extra lane, right? Is to clear it as fast as possible. This is actually being used in Florida quite often. It's called the Florida Road Rangers. Um, and the Road Rangers typically respond within about 15 to 30 minutes. And they're estimated to generate about $6.70 in benefit for every dollar spent. So again, these are really low hanging fruits that doesn't cost, you know, adding a whole extra lane or massive sort of infrastructure um, changes. It's 
tiny little things that we can we can add into our highway uh, patrol. Oh, that's, those sound really good. I mean, I got to say, I'm not much on paying taxes, but if somebody wants to take a few dollars out of my paycheck to pay for one of those incident screens to stop all that rubbernecking, I'm all for it. <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, okay, Sabrina, let's talk about solutions to inner city traffic problems now. One of the things we keep hearing about is multimodal mobility. Sounds pretty high tech, but what is it and how far in the future is it? Okay, so... Uh, I like the I like the idea because Omar what was talking a little bit earlier about the fact that the population is going to continue to increase. So we need to really find some solution uh, to be able to uh, eliminate part of those problems. So, um, like I said, most of most of the population actually in 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 the Canadian in the Canada is really uh, living really close to the border, uh, around like the, the, the first 100 miles from, from the border. So it's really, really close. So the trend will continue to increase. So we're going to see more and more problem with the, 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 the population uh, growing. So if we compare a little bit to uh, Europe, for example, they have really an advance a little bit uh, in front of us, and they are really more advanced in all of those multimodal type of um, of transport. So I really think that if we stick to the way that we are doing actually, and, and we, uh, Christine gave some example a little bit earlier about the fact that uh, the roads in Canada, we can compare the, the, the worst road in, in terms of traffic to some of uh, the roads in the US. Uh, if we if we are able to compare us as uh, Los Angeles, for example, in in Ontario and also in Montreal, I really think it's it's not a good news in some way. So this is why we need to to change the way and integrate some kind of other type of model way to uh, to do the com the commute. So um, if we think about what it, it can represent, th those type of commute, I really think that it's a bunch of stuff, you know. So uh, autonomous car uh, is part of that. The public transportation is also part of that. The electric car and bikes. and But everything needs to be at some point connected all together in a digital way. So we need to have a smart grid that's going to be able to talk to each other, but also to the infrastructure in uh, in the um, uh, in the city. So uh, at the end, the intention is really to uh, ameliorate and increase a significant amount of information uh, and give that to the to the public. So, are we able to give uh, a little bit more of information about uh, the routes, uh, also a different type of mode, the parking, uh, the arrival time? Uh, the accident, the weather, we see that a little bit in some kind of application, but uh, are we able to integrate the flood, the ice, the wind, the visibility, if there is some problem, some pothole in, in, into, on the road? So that's all the combined information that we're going to be able to, um, to, to give to the, to, to the population that's going to help them to decide what's going to be the, the route that, they're gonna, that they are going to take, you know? So if we think about, is that really far away from us, actually? Uh, do we need to wait a little bit more to, uh, to see that appears in Canada, in Canada, for example? Honestly, I don't think so, because uh, in the sense, uh, Lavanne, we are already doing a bunch of stuff all in 3D. So all the infrastructure is designed in 3D. So if we are thinking about pipes, uh, Mano, for example. so. All that information need to be all integrated in a, in a common space. So it's going to be uh, more intelligent and it can give us a lot more of information to be able to take some decision. Um, for example, in UK, we have uh, actually uh, a mandate with, uh, with England and Wales that we are designing all the underground utilities for the whole the whole region. And the intention is to assist them to decide what's going to be the next constr construction into the future uh, of their project. So it's going to be like helping them to decide where we're going to do some work. Uh, in Vancouver, here in Canada, we have done um, internally a digital twin with uh, the Canada Line. 
So the Canada line is completely designed and we have a copy of the Canada line. So all the infrastructure are integrated into that digital twin. So we have the rail, we have the track, uh, and we are able to take more decision when we are uh, doing the, um, the operation and the maintenance of that system. So if you replicate that into a road, for example, it's going to help us to do the same, you know, take decision, uh, be able to plan more in advance and give some option to uh, the population to make sure that they have different type of uh, solution to where they, they can go and use different type of, uh, of mode. So um, if we, we, we think about uh, the next step, uh, we're going to be able to integrate some LiDAR scan in that. Uh, security camera, uh, everything should be all integrated uh, and give more information to, uh, to the population. So that's the way that we are trying, trying actually to work with the government and also the city to, get, to give them bet, better idea to do engineering and design to make sure that they will think about that at, at the first step and think about if we, we Sometimes we can invest a little bit more uh, early into the design and take those information and put that into a 3D model. At the end, it's going to facilitate the rest, facilitate the decision, facilitate the information that we will be able to give uh, into, uh, into all the, that common data altogether. So um, I really think we do not have really, uh, really the choice. We really need to move forward and changing the way that we are moving from the point A to, to the point B and, and have diverse possibility of, of commute. And I think it's really going to facilitate the way and reduce the traffic, reduce the impact and give it a bit more time to the people. When the people is going to see uh, an, uh, more time available, uh, they, they, they're going to take the other option, you know, it's all the valuable time that uh, is going to be important for the people. Thanks very much. Omar, more about uh, simple roadworthy um, solutions. How do synchronized traffic signals work? What's the secret sauce of timing lights to maximum traffic flow and how effective are they? I think the city of Ottawa uses its own proprietary system. So how do we change the speed and synchronization in response to different traffic situations? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, I think one of the things like safety is always our first priority, right? So getting people safe, safely through any intersection is, is important. Um, but then, you know, Sabrina was mentioning data. We need to know where people are coming, where people are going, because we need to be able to, um, essentially allocate proportions for cars, bikes, and pedestrians. So if, an, if a location has a lot of pedestrian traffic, well, they can't cross through or you know, pass through an intersection as quickly as a car can. And so those have that sort of impacts in terms of how the signalization is sort of set up. Um, and there's really a, you know, like a full spectrum of, of systems, everything from what would be called a fixed time. Um, so that's basically two minutes allocated, you know, a minute 20 or minute 25 is allocated for the main street, five seconds of, of amber and reds for safety purposes, um, you know, 25 seconds on the side road, and then uh, another five seconds for proper clearance and so forth. And that's a, it just runs like that constantly all day long. Um, and then sort of the other extreme would be more of a sort of a actuated or fully actuated where sensors in the road, uh, push buttons, everything sort of triggering things. And so within sort of certain parameters, if there's no traffic coming, it would say, okay, well, I don't need to have the green light on the main street on as long. I can turn it off because now there's somebody waiting on the side street. And uh, you know, one of my colleagues often says, there's only 60 seconds in a minute. And our goal is really to not have any wasted time and wasted green time. So when there's a, you know, when you're sitting at a light and there's a green light on the opposite direction and no cars coming, that's unused time and valuable time that we could try to recover. And so our system here in the city of Ottawa, so we sort of uh, go a little bit back, you know, back and forth between the two. Um, in the downtown core where traffic is sort of more consistent, you can go more of a fixed time. There's not that variability that, yeah, 
but on a Sunday night in the suburbs uh, where a local road meets a major road, you want to be able to be have that sort of adaptive actuated type of system. And so, um, you know, like, like here in the city of Ottawa, when I leave my parents' place after a Sunday night dinner, I get down to the main road out of, off of their, uh, out of their community. And the system knows that I'm there. And it says, okay, the main road is got 20 seconds minimum of, of uh, green time. Omar just arrived just after the, the red light, it turned red light for him. I'll give them five seconds of, of green, and then I'll go through my 15 second countdown, and then I'll let Omar go. Because there's no other traffic, it's, it's trying to work through and make sure that I'm not sitting there for two minutes waiting for that light to change. And that then uh, all ensures that people are, um, you know, actually being not driving through the red lights, taking un unnecessary safety, uh, you know, actions. Um, but one of the advantages that we sort of seen with our sort of our custom system is that it's allowed us to really kind of start experimenting with things. So we are looking at adaptive signals where basically we're adding some additional intelligence um, where the sensors are able to see what's kind of coming down the road and tell other signals, hey, there's more traffic coming. So a, a very good example is Christmas Eve. Everybody seems to get out of work a little bit early. Bosses are a little bit nicer to all of us. And suddenly rush hour is no longer at the 3.30 to 5.30, it's now two to four. And so having an adaptive system and an actuated system, but a more an adaptive system, it's able to recognize that traffic volume is a little bit higher than what is normal. And so rather than using my regular middle of the day plan, I'm gonna switch to my rush hour plan. And then it's able to process traffic through and, and more effectively. Um, we've also been sort of experimenting with something called green light optimized speed advisory. So that's where we can actually provide the driver with information as to what would be the best speed to actually drive to get to the traffic light when it turns green. So therefore, they don't have to stop because every time that someone has to stop and start again, we're losing time. Mm -hmm. um, reaction time for people having to say, oh, cars are starting to move ahead, gaps and so forth. Um, and, and really where the technology is starting to go um, is actually not being able to just tell the driver, but telling the self-driving car that, hey, you're a little bit ahead of everybody else, slow down, as uh, Dr. Abdelhai was sort of mentioning, slow down, package yourself up to a more of a little peloton, and we will get this group of 40 cars through the light, all, all as a flock, and then be able to use the green time in, in the other opposite direction. So. You know, technology is getting us to the point where that's going to be possible. It's probably still another, you know, 10, 15 years. I may be retired by the time that actually comes to total fruition. But the opportunity of these new technologies are starting to um, provide us that, that, you know, the, the advantage of using the systems and technology and maximizing our, our use. Um, so. Thanks very much, Omar. Uh, professor, um, I think your artificial intelligence is being used now to um, speed up and even ma make Omar's uh, intelligent traffic signals even better. In fact, I think you're already mapping out some of Toronto's main thoroughfares digitally. So how does artificial work uh, intelligence work downtown um, and does it work as well as it does on the highway? Well, uh, actually it's, it's even better than uh, on highways. Well, as Omar said, um, like all of us experience stopping at the red light and then you see the cross uh, direction has green but there are no cars there and you're thinking how dumb can this be well because the basic clunker traffic lights are not that smart they are just on a cycle keep repeating the same thing while traffic coming approaching an intersection from all directions is very highly dynamic. The people, platoons come at it depending on what's happening upstream and so on. So now what can we do? Imagine a traffic light. I want you to envision this. Imagine a traffic light with eyes and a brain. This is exactly what our system at UFT that we developed does. So the eyes look at the approaching traffic way ahead of like maybe three, 400 meters coming from the upstream and from all directions at the same time. And then there is a piece of software based on artificial intelligence that says, given the state of what I'm looking at, which direction should I move now for how long? 
and keep updating my thinking every second. So every second, the traffic light is asking itself, should I continue with the northbound guys or should I switch to the westbound or the eastbound and, and whatnot? So think of it as using that intelligent brain, uh, looking at the data from the sensors and making decisions um, at the rate of um, every second. We are very, very efficient with time. We don't waste time at all. As a, as a matter of fact, like if you optimize traffic lights with artificial intelligence, at least in simulations that we've done in our labs, you can cut down the delay at intersections by approximately half. That is, for instance, if, I, if you stop regularly at each traffic light for a minute and I shave off half of it per intersection and your commute takes you through uh, 30 intersections end to end, then I've saved you 15 minutes. So that's quite a bit of um, uh, savings um, that, that way outweighs the cost. Like to put technologies like this in the field, you just need cameras and maybe a small computer, like $20,000 or so. Uh, maybe by the time you do the system integration in the field, it's a little bit more, but you recoup that in savings in days, not years. It's just the reduction in, in delay for people. You recoup that um, uh, in days. So the benefit to cost ratio here is, is amazing. Um, I got to ask then, I mean, you know, both the ramp metering and these intelligent lights sound absolutely wonderful why aren't we doing this already i mean it seems like such a no-brainer well the, ai is, is popping up everywhere in our lives now so it's, it's like especially the, the high end of it um so it, it takes a little bit of money like you need to put equipment in the field uh, but also it needs to it needs a little bit of courage and in, in, in my opinion to adopt uh, a brand new thing, like public procurement in general, uh, municipalities want to buy things that are quote unquote tried and true. So we want to see a system that works well in Boston yeah. or in Singapore or China or the, sorry, New York and say, hey, let's buy that and put it in Toronto. Um, well, first of all, it's good to see that they are careful with taxpayers' money and want to buy things that are tried and true. But when we're talking about cutting edge innovative technology, innovation by default is not tried and true elsewhere, right? So if you, if you wanna wait until it's tried and true elsewhere, first of all, good luck waiting for a decade. Um, number two, you will buy it at a high cost because somebody else developed it and now they wanna profit from it. So we will import it from them uh, at a very high cost. And number three, we will never try out our innovation. Like what's the point of having the University of Toronto uh, in the city of Toronto if we're gonna buy Chinese systems and American systems um, uh, and, and so on. So the challenge here is that like what one recommendation that I have to get out of this is that I encourage municipalities to have um, uh, uh, some budget for field testing of cutting edge technology. Yeah, we, we might not get it right the first time when I put an AI system on the street. So we try it carefully until it works at one, two, three intersections, and then we're comfortable with it. Then we uh, make it spread everywhere. Well, I got to tell you something, uh, uh, Professor. I've got a funny feeling that if there was a referendum put on a ballot in Toronto, you would get 100% votes. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Christine. What are other, uh, we got to move along here. We're actually a bit behind schedule, but what are some of the other traffic solutions that the CEA is promoting? Uh, for instance, what is variable speed limits and how do they work? So uh, it's it's funny that you talked about the variable speed limits. We've sort of heard a lot of these examples already in, in different formats, but essentially what variable speed limits are is a system that um, uh, reduces the speed of uh, traffic congestion uh, when they know it's imminent. So exactly what the professor was talking about, reducing the speed before traffic is coming um, so that this way people aren't um, getting stuck uh, in traffic. And you know what this really helps with is we're talking about being able to help this with our, our congestion, but this has a whole other benefit on the side of things. Um, just think about you know fuel efficiency. Um, Omar was talking about you know speeding to the stop sign and then start speeding to the light and then having to stop and then waiting and then starting your car 
up again and then stopping. And every single time you do that, you're wasting a lot of fuel. Yeah. Um, and CAA study, when we looked at the bottlenecks in congestion across um, uh, Canada, we saw that um, in congestion, we waste 22 million liters of fuel, which translate to about 58 million uh, kilograms of CO2. And just to give you a picture of that, essentially, we would need to plant an extra 2 million trees. This is all annually. 2 million trees to be able to offset all of that. So, you know, the we, we've got a bunch of solutions, which um, the solutions that I had written down have all been shared here and, and you know, CAA supports those. But it's, again, also just bringing it back to why it's important to experiment with some of these solutions, because it's not just saving some of our time, but it's also saving environment and people's pocketbooks yeah. and saving them money um, on fuel as well. Okay, thank you very much. Sabrina, uh, what about connected and autonomous cars? Can they really help reduce traffic? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the intention. If we compare, for example, to, um, uh, we were talking about a little bit of that, Professor was talking about the fact that we want to make sure that uh, the vehicle and the flow of the vehicle is a little bit more um, not push into the system. We need to have a a, a, a better um, a better uh, debit. So the intention is, if we are taking, for example, we are we have done a little bit of platooning in uh, in the U.S. Uh, we have done some uh, work like that in Florida, and it, it and the re result was good. So uh, re reducing emission, re reducing costs, reducing fuel, and we can take that and transfer that knowledge to uh, autonomous car and electrical an electrical car also. So I really think at the end, it's going to reduce uh, the traffic. Uh, we can try, like a professor was proposing, to implement those kind of solution uh, some time to, to time in some city and to try to do a, a little bit of testing. Uh, of those to see what are the results and see uh, if uh, it's really improving uh, the, the the reduction of the traffic. But I really think it's something that we 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 can take and transfer the knowledge to try to do that uh, here uh, in Canada with uh, some electrical and autonomous car. Thank you very much, Omar. Okay, tell us what happened during the pandemic. Um, didn't public transportation take a hit? Also, aren't people uh, more people working from home? Uh, what's the effect of that? Um, I'm guessing there's uh, lower, lower traffic, but is it a uniform reduction in traffic every day or is it asymmetrical? One day it, there's lots of traffic and one day there's not so much traffic. And, and what does that do to like a fixed um, uh, traffic system such as your own that isn't as adaptive as we hope the future will be? Yeah, um, yeah, life certainly changed what the onset of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, and, and I think, you know, in time, everything will re re rebound as, as humans, we're, uh, we have both short and long memories on certain things. We remember certain, you know, the way things were in certain aspects. Um, I, you know, I think at the onset, we were down 30 to 50% of normal traffic volumes and, and transit as well, right? There weren't people who needed to go to the office in March of 2020, March, May, you know, through May of 2020. And so life kind of stopped uh, to some degree. Um, traffic in the suburbs seemed to drop less than coming through and into the downtown. And that was largely because now people were, as you said, working from home. So people were taking their lunch hour and going to do groceries or doing other things because they were closer to where they sort of do a lot of their activities. Um, and what we saw, what we've seen, so is basically that the morning rush hour dropped more than the afternoon. And that's largely, I think, because people were like, well, I don't have to be in at, at 8 or 8.30. I can get in at 10. I'll work out from home for a little bit and then go into the office a little bit later. And that seems to still be there, um, although it's slowly recovering. Um, but today, what we're actually kind of seeing is like in some places, you know, we're anywhere between 90% and 150% of pre-pandemic uh, levels. And it varies across the city. Um, as you were mentioning, it varies also by day of week. Uh, originally, you know, during the start of the pandemic and, and through 2022, it seemed like hybrid meant you don't go into the office on Mondays and Fridays and everybody was trying to squeeze Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. 
Um, and Friday still seems to be a little bit lighter traffic uh, than others, but but Mondays is starting to pick up as well. So, you know, for for a traffic system like like I was saying, you know, in the downtown core we use more fixed. Um, it's just easier. There's not th that variability so much. But out in the suburbs and and uh, you know outer urban and, and suburb areas, our, our system is much more adaptive. And so when volumes change, um, we're able to uh, to handle it a little bit better. Um, but you know it goes back to the original point of you need the data, you need to know where people are going, where people are traveling to, and so forth to be able to make those adjustments to the timing plans to to handle that those sort of things. And and often we'll do a traffic study. Uh, for new communities, you do traffic studies and you sort of evaluate where people are going to go and how they're going to get around. Um, and what was done pre-pandemic and what's now today, kind of different. And uh, you know, we'll see how see how it shifts, you know, uh, over over the next couple of years. But I suspect that with growth in population and everything else, we're going to get back to the point where we'll be, you know, very much similar to the way it was pre-pandemic. Thanks very much, Omar. Professor Abdelhai. I think I'm leaving the elephant in the room to you. Few people really want to discuss congestion charges. Um, they've been implemented in London, England, where I think it now costs about $25 a day if you want to drive downtown. So would something like that be effective in, say, Toronto? And what is dynamic congestion pricing that I think your uh, research um, recommends? Well, again, I remind us of the basics we discussed before, if demand exceeds capacity, one, it will not fit, two, capacity will drop, which is a nightmare, right? So one way to make sure that demand does not exceed the capacity we have is congestion pricing. It's not only effective, but love it or hate it, it's inevitable, it, it, it is coming. In my in my opinion, it's it's much like a, like traffic lights, it's a control device. If you hate traffic lights and say, hey, they delay me and I have to stop and so on. Okay, let's turn them off at 5 p.m. downtown Toronto and see if anyone's going anywhere, right? So the price when you stop at a traffic light is a price to keep the system working in an orderly manner. Similarly, congestion price will make the system work in an orderly manner. And the price of not doing that is much higher all the gridlock and the frustration and the billions of dollars we're wasting um, that, we'll see, that we see. But prudence also implies that there is a decent transit in place. Like we cannot price roads and then there's no transit. So what would people do? So I think we need to focus on building higher order transit in particular, such as commuter rail, subways, LRT, and perhaps, uh, build them on borrowed money that will be paid back from um, uh, the, the, conge the congestion charges um, that will come um, uh, when, when they are implemented. Now, you asked another question, what is dynamic congestion pricing? Well, there is, you can price a road for anything. You can price a road because you want to raise money to, to pave the road or to build, to build transit or whatnot. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about pricing the roads to combat congestion. And congestion has a peak. So it's like a triangle, it gets worse, 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 worse during the peak of the peak and then down, 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 down and traffic results. So we want the price to have the same shape, triangular shape. So during the peak is the highest. And uh, as you go away from the peak, it's less, less, less until it becomes zero. The effect of that is that it incentivizes people to spread themselves across the day. Remember again, the rise video and the pacing, we want people to spread over time. And when you have time dependent congestion pricing, as Omar was saying, maybe I, I like, do I wanna be in the office at 8 a.m. and pay $10 or can I go at 11, work from home in the morning and go at 11 and pay nothing? So some people with, who have flexibility, we will respond to the, the time dependent uh, pricing by spreading themselves over time, which guarantees that the inflow of cars in the system is precisely at the capacity of the system and there wouldn't be such meltdown and, and gridlock that we experience every day. Thanks very much. Well, we got a 
a few minutes um, left uh, for some very quick questions. Omar, I'm going to go back to you on this one. Roundabouts, do they really help traffic? Um, are are they, uh, I mean, we keep hearing, you know, from uh, uh, Europe that they're much better for traffic than traffic lights. Are they really? And if they are, why don't we have more of them in Canada, do you think? Yeah, they, they, they certainly um, optimize the flow, right? So no longer are you waiting for that light that might be, you know, 60 seconds or, or, or more before you get to move forward. It's, it's very much like uh, Dr. Abelhai was saying about managing that flow through through an area. So as soon as a car arrives, if there's no other cars there, it can go and make, whether it's a left turn or continue on straight, it can go and do that. And it just kind of the flow adjusts. Um, and we actually uh, here at the city of Ottawa did that in uh, out in the Orleans community, which is just to the east of the city, um, large intersection um, of St. Joseph and Jean d'Arc. It was a hill coming down, so actually we actually had some, you know, a number of collisions actually that used to happen uh, with people coming down the hill. And by putting that into a, actually a, a roundabout, what you actually we've basically eliminated those collisions that had T-bone collisions that were happening, and the traffic is now flowing on a regular basis. Yeah, you might get delayed, and there might be six or seven cars waiting, you know, ahead of you while the other direction it goes but then all of a sudden it clears out no one else is coming the other way and all of a sudden all six or seven cars go through and so it's a it's a much more of a, a ebb and flow kind of thing of waves and and it seems to work fairly well yeah Thanks they work much. well if i may interject they work well for moderate traffic mm -hmm. so if you have light to moderate traffic they are amazing but once you have very very heavy traffic then again you have the on ramp situation and people are fighting and, and so on then a yeah. traffic light at that at that time would be better. Yeah, because because you know all of us have a different sense of uh, confidence, I guess I'll say, in merging and not merging into traffic. Yeah. And so yeah. if that gap isn't there, or you think it might be there, you suddenly go now you're stopping and you're influencing all the all the surrounding surrounding traffic, it could, or you might just be hesitant and wait until all the cars clear, even though there were gaps that you could do. And that's where they, as the volume increases, that sort of, um, that conflict increases as well. Well, I got time for one more quick answer, Sabrina. Um, this is a little off topic, but it is so cool. Um, I read something in one of your papers that talks about asphalt, pavement, the stuff we make roads of, yeah. that is able to absorb carbon dioxide, reduce pollution. Can you tell us just a, a little bit about that before we go? Yeah, uh, so this is really technology to, to, to be able to reduce a little bit, like you said, the carbon emission. So uh, we have done that uh, in, in UK. So in, in Europe, it's a little bit more uh, easy, uh, easy to implement and testing those kind of stuff, I think so. So yeah, I, I really think it's something that we, we maybe try at some point to see uh, if it, it could be functional uh, here in Canada. But like I, we, we were trying to discuss a little bit earlier, if we, if we want to, to, to be able to uh, increase our uh, innovation uh, into some project and engineering in general, we need to try, you know, have some testing and, and, and small pieces of project that we try those kind of stuff. So, so yeah, that is something that, uh, that, that we are able to do and we have uh, the capabilities uh, in uh, our global team uh, all, all together. Well, a roadway that can reduce carbon dioxide, you know, there's another uh, use for my tax dollars that I'd be willing to spend. <laughs> okay. Um, well, folks, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Traffic congestion is traffic congestion is a complex problem, and I hope you found today's discussion as illuminating as I did. That's all thanks to Sabrina, Christine, Omar, and Professor Abdulhai. My heartfelt thanks for helping us to understand a problem we all have to endure. Most especially, thanks goes out to everyone who joined us for this discussion. And if you enjoyed today's debate, tune in two weeks from now as we delve into the rapidly growing world of hydrogen fueled transportation. My many thanks again for watching Driving Into the Future and have a good day. <laughs>